Welcome back to chapter 8. We are going to be talking about a few additional types of collisions now that we've gotten the idea of conservation of momentum and how collision problems tend to work uh, as a foundation. So um, we just finished up with a couple of examples of two-step problems. Those tend to be the problems that are um, the toughest for students who are having trouble understanding the physics concepts behind problems. And the ones that we have left in this chapter uh, can kind of be grouped into two main categories. Elastic collision problems, and we'll be talking about those in this video, and two-dimensional problems, and we'll be talking about that in a separate lecture video. Both of those are a little bit tougher mathematically, um, although they are fairly straightforward on the physics concept side. All right, so why do physicists care so much about elastic collisions? Well, the key thing that we're going to talk about when we discuss what that term really means is that at the atomic level, pretty much every collision that's happening at small scales acts as an elastic collision. And so everything that we know about atoms is from a century of smashing things together. And at that level, we keep all the kinetic energy before the collision and after, which is not true in most of the collisions that we've seen so far. So this term, elastic collisions, is when things hit each other and we don't lose any kinetic energy because of friction or heat or anything else. If we had a perfect Super Bowl, that would be considered an elastic collision. We really don't see those um, very much at the macroscopic level, at the large scales. Pretty much every other collision we can just talk about as not elastic, although the term inelastic is used. Um, it just sounds very much like in an elastic collision, and we don't want to get confused with that. So there's either elastic collisions or not elastic collisions. So let's talk about these special type of collisions and what allows us to do extra pro problem solving when we know that that's the collision that's happening. So we can call a collision elastic if it has the same amount of kinetic energy before as it does after. So for example, a ball that collides with a wall, the wall doesn't move, that means that the incoming velocity of that ball um, is equal and opposite to the, oppos uh, to the outgoing velocity. So let's think about what that would look like if what we are trying to apply is the momentum conservation equation and the kinetic energy conservation equation. There's really not a special kinetic energy conservation equation, but if we say that, hey, all of the terms have kinetic energy at the beginning, and that's going to be equal to all of the kinetic energy terms at the end. Kind of like a very specialized chapter 7, just energy balance problem. Then we now have two equations, and we can solve for two unknowns. That's what makes these problems special, and it allows us to actually think into the future what's going to happen, rather than being given one of the final velocities. Now, what I'm going to show you here on the slides is the hard way, the full math that we will not need to use for our course, but I want us to understand what this would look like. And then we'll introduce the um, easier method that we want everyone to be using in Physics 125. We don't need the harder way. And there'll be a full example problem worked out with that easier method. Okay, so we have the situation where there's a two kilogram block that slides and hits a four kilogram block, but they don't stick together and we don't know either of the um, final velocities, but what we are told is that they have an elastic collision. Okay, so the idea is any collision requires the momentum conservation equation. That's the top um, equation of the two on the slides. And if we're told that it's elastic, that means we can write out the second equation here on the slides, all of the kinetic energy terms, one half mv squared, for the two objects before and the two objects after. Kind of like a very, very specific energy balance problem from chapter seven. 
Okay, so we're going to show the math, but again, before I even show it, I want us to understand that this is not the two sets, uh, this is not the set of equations that I want us to use when we're solving these in our course, because there is going to be an easier way that we'll introduce. All right, so we plug in all of the numbers that we have. We now have two equations and two unknowns here on the slide. Pause if you want to write this down, but as a reminder, this isn't the method that we'll be using in this class. We have to plug one of the um, unknowns in, so we'll solve for v1 in one of the equations, then we'll substitute that into equation 2, and then we can solve for that remaining unknown. There's a lot of math on both sides because we have to um, deal with velocities squared alongside velocities that aren't squared. And again, you can pause this if you really want to go through all of these steps in your notebook, but we don't need this particular method. Instead, what we find as our final answer here is that one of the blocks is going 3.33 meters per second, so three and a third meters per second to the right. The other block is going 1.67 meters per second or one and two thirds meters per second to the left. And what we find when we look at those numbers is that those two, when you think about the fact that they're in opposite directions, they actually add up in total to the five meters per second that the incoming velocity had. So what we've actually figured out is that the speed that these two masses come together in one dimension is equal to the speed of the masses when they leave. There's a kind of flip in direction, but the idea stays the same. So this equation that is now on the slide is the one that will be provided on equation sheets and that we should be using to solve elastic collision problems. This equation and the standard momentum conservation equation. So if we plug in our results from the previous um, example, five minus zero, is equal to three and a third minus a negative one and two thirds, which adds up to five. So that does work with the method that we were using. So elastic collisions in our Physics 125 course are gonna use these two, um, these two equations. Those velocities on that second line should also have the arrows above them. They are still caring about plus and minus for this one dimensional motion but it's an easier um, kind of known tool that can be used in one dimension, which is all we're going to be working with elastic collisions on. So this example, a head-on collision where we're trying to find the velocities afterward using the two equations on the previous slide is worked out as its own full example video. And we really wanna make sure that we understand that we're using that easier method in that example video and not the harder method that was on the slides to indicate the kind of starting point that we could be using if we didn't have this other tool available. Okay, so in our homework problems, we definitely wanna use this easier algebra method with this known result in physics for one dimension. It limits us, we can only use it in one dimension, but that's okay, that's all physics 125 requires of us. And no matter what kind of collision we're talking about, whether it's a um, standard things hit each other, or they stick together, or there's a recoil problem, or it's a two-step problem, or it's elastic, or it's in two dimensions, every single collision that we have will use the momentum conservation equation. In our next video, we'll be talking about how to handle situations that aren't fully elastic, but we still don't know what the final velocities are at the end. We'll be introducing the idea of coefficient of restitution in that next video before moving on to two-dimensional collisions. I'll see you in the next one.